This episode is brought to you by The Jordan Harbinger Show. Okay, everyone, summer's coming, so it's time to get your summer reading list together. But there are going to be times when you're too tired to hold a book or some electronic device. Sometimes you want to just lie there and let someone else do all the work. And that means a podcast. And I recommend that that podcast be a top-shelf podcast named Best of Apple in 2018. One that brings on fascinating people, athletes, authors, and scientists, to mobsters and spies. I'm talking about, of course, The Jordan Harbinger Show. Either entertain me or inform me. And that's what Jordan does with each and every episode. Let me recommend two specific episodes to you. I suggest listening to episode 655, David Eagleman, How Our Brains Construct Reality, and episode 662, Daniel J. Levetin, How to Think Critically in the Post-Truth Era. You can't go wrong with adding the Jordan Harbinger show to your rotation. It's incredibly interesting. There's never a dull show. Search for the Jordan Harbinger show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Bonus episode. Providence Lost with Paul Lay. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Paul Lay, Fellow of the Royal Historical Society, Trustee of the Cromwell Museum in Huntingdon, and Editor of History Today, the monthly magazine which aims to bring serious academic history to as wide and public an audience as possible. He's also the author of the brilliant Providence Lost, The Rise and Fall of Cromwell's Protectorate, a wonderfully engaging read which we'll be talking about today. Paul, thank you so much for joining me. Pleasure. So... It's on the title of the book. It's very important to the entire era. But what was, or perhaps is, the idea of providence? Well, providence is a pretty much universally held concept in the 17th century, uh, which, of course, is uh, the period when these events happen. It's not something that's exclusive to the parliamentarian side or Puritans. Royalists take a providential worldview just as much as their opponents do. And it's basically, to put it simple, it's the idea that God guides everything, that nothing happens without God's intention. Uh, That may be the hair falling out of your head, or it may be victory or defeat on the battlefield. And in fact, victory on the battlefield is generally held, or was generally held, to be the most obvious sign of God's providence, that God was on your side, literally. And so when you were defeated, you had been abandoned by God. When you won, you'd been vindicated by him. And that's the simple kind of worldview. It gets slightly more complicated when we think about Calvinism, and which was a concept held by many on the parliamentarian side and had indeed been a factor in English Protestantism uh, since its earliest days. And Calvinism... Uh, and its associated uh, puritanical theological beliefs, holds to the idea of predestination. And what that means is that God, before the creation of the world, has decided the fate of every person who will ever live. And what that fate depends on, what that fate is about, is whether they are saved 
or they are damned. It means whether one goes into heaven or one goes down into hell. And there's nothing, because it's already been decided at the beginning of time, there's nothing you can do to change that fate. All you can do is look around the signs that you are one of those elect. And obviously, victory on the battlefield is one of those markers that you are one of the elect. Perhaps great wealth or happiness is part of this or high status, whatever. People are constantly looking for symbols that they are part of this elect, that they will have this eternal life in heaven. And you can compare it to something like a kind of surveillance system. It's a surveillance system of the soul. It's a little bit like, to use a pat analogy, the way in which social media intrudes on everything on our lives. If we think about the way we are received in social media, we're looking if we're part of the people on the right side, if you know what I mean. We're part of the people who think the right thoughts when we get reception on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or whatever. When we get nice things said about us, it reinforces the idea that we're part of the good. When people say things against us, it breeds anxiety. Well, you imagine this is so much worse. You can leave social media, but you can't leave God's judgment. And so it's this constant gnawing anxiety that's very, very typical of the Puritan mind. And you see this quite a lot in Oliver Cromwell, who's in almost constant conversation with his God. And when it comes to the big decisions, he's looking for the correct decision to make. You find this particularly when he's offered the crown, for example, when Parliament tries to make him King Oliver. Uh, and he finds it, he goes to God to justify whether to take the crown or not. It's interesting, the comparisons between Cromwell as a soldier and Cromwell as a politician. As a soldier, Cromwell is incredibly decisive. Uh, he is a man of immense personal courage, immense bravery, who leads by example, and of course a man who never loses a significant military encounter. All signs of God's will. And then when he becomes a politician, he becomes more of a prevaricating figure. And I think increasingly as his political career goes on and he faces hindrances, even military defeat. Obviously in Pax Britannica, we haven't reached the Protectorate yet. So just could you explain to listeners what the Protectorate was and how it was established? Yes, well, the really big decision is the trial and execution of Charles I that takes place after the Second Civil War, when Parliament wins. And Parliament does try to reach a deal with Charles I, even though he's been defeated. But a group of people on, we'll say, the Puritan wing become totally exasperated by him particularly those in the army. And this is when we first see Oliver Cromwell come to the fore as a political rather than a military figure during the trial of Charles I. And this is in December 1648 and his execution in January 1649. And this is a decision, I won't go into the uh, the machinations of the trial here, but it's a kind of loaded, semi-legal uh, phenomenon. Um, but it's decided that Charles will be executed as a traitor to his people, a man of blood who's caused immense suffering in two civil wars. This decision is made, but no one really knows what to do next. There is talk of a republic, a commonwealth is declared, the House of Lords is abolished, the monarchy is abolished. Um, and through this, we have the conquest of Scotland and Ireland. Ireland, of course, the deeply controversial 
uh, the Camp Cromwell's campaign in Ireland, a deeply controversial affair that resonates very, very strongly to this day in Ireland. Um, and then the conquest of Scotland, in which Cromwell's then number two, uh, John Lambert, another brilliant cavalry commander, uh, rises into the ascendance, particularly at the Battle of Dunbar um, in September the 3rd. Um, and that's a very important date. That's um, September the 3rd, 1650. And a year later, in September the 3rd, 1651, Charles the Second, or the future Charles the Second, Charles Stuart, is defeated at the Battle of Worcester, escapes into exile, and from then on, the, the Commonwealth regime, or whatever it may manifest itself in future, is militarily secure. There are royalist plots, of course there are, but I think the European powers, France and Spain in particular, recognise that this is a formidable military power. It's battle tested. It's not only the army, it's army that calls itself the saints. It really believes it's an elect nation's army, the elect of the elect. Uh, it's battle hardened. It's battle tested. There's also a very, very significant naval presence. And so you have pretty much an established uh, regime here. But the rump parliament that exists is not one that's really delivering any goods so far as the army is concerned. And a person becomes immensely significant at that time is Cromwell. And when Cromwell really, and it's very much on his volition, abolishes the um, rump parliament, uh, dismisses it in April 1653, he becomes just about the single most powerful man in the history of Britain. But he does seek to rule with a parliament. And he experiments in parliaments. This is a man who likes the idea of parliament, but is a little bit troubled by their reality, which is probably why he has so many of them. Uh, but his first one, 1653, is something called, his first experiment in Parliament, is something called the Nominated Assembly. And it's called the Nominated Assembly because the members of Parliament are nominated by members of the gathered churches. These are the independent churches, the radical Protestant churches. And although actually most of them or many of them are nominated actually by the Council of State that Cromwell has around him. But this is the brainchild of someone called Thomas Harrison, who is, uh, like Lambert, a formidable military commander, who is the most significant figure of a group of people called the Fifth Monarchists. Uh, they are on the more fundamentalist side of Puritanism, shall we say, and they believe in a kind of teleological view of history that begins in Babylon through uh, the Jewish state through to Rome in both its uh, ancient and modern uh, popish form in a fifth monarchy which will be the final monarchy on earth ready for Christ's return and they believe that this will happen in England, as long as England becomes morally and spiritually reformed. Now, as you can imagine, this nominated assembly, which is also rather mockingly called the bare bones parliament, after one of its Puritan uh, MPs called Praise God Barbon, who's um, a rather um, typical name for the more extreme Puritans at that time, it's actually less radical in its way than one might think. Uh, 
Cromwell always manages to be something of a conservative presence. And I think that's true of those who are very close to him. And so the radical ideas, the fundamentalist religious ideas that one would expect of a parliament based upon the Jewish Sanhedrin, which this is what this is modeled on, what Harrison models this parliament on, um, is actually relatively conservative and actually makes some very good legal reform. But a lot of its members are quite suspicious of the army, which is which remains throughout this period, the fundamental power in the land. Nothing happens without the army's support. And so the army becomes resisting, resistant towards bare bones. And Cromwell, in one of his classic moves, gets others to dismiss the parliament, to enter parliament, to, to dismiss uh, the Bourbon's parliament, and it disappears. But that's not the end by any means of Cromwell's exp experiments in parliament. For the next experiment, he turns to his number two, John Lambert, who has not been happy with the Bourbon's assembly. He's, he's a man of rather elusive religious ideas in a way, but he writes, or he has written, while the nominated assembly is in office, he writes um, what becomes the world's first written constitution, which is called the Instruments of Government. And to simplify what he's trying to do, um, he has turned the old governmental trinity of king, lords, and commons into a new trinity of a new position called the protector because uh, he knows Cromwell won't accept the title of king or believes he won't accept the title of king so this new uh, head of state title the protector is thought up uh, then there's a council of state uh, which replaces the lords roughly and then there's this rather denuded House of Commons, it says. So that's this new trinity. And Cromwell accepts the idea of Lord Protector, which is what he becomes. So this um, uh, form of government, this instrument of government, uh, is accepted and it becomes a relatively efficient model, as I said before, and as always in the Protectorate. Um, it rests upon the idea of um, the army's support. But Cromwell has the army's support. Cromwell appears to be the one figure who can unite both civilian Puritans and the army. He's trusted relatively by both of them, and he becomes this highly significant figure. And it becomes a kind of quasi-monarchy where Cromwell has certain regalia, uh, he accepts the, the title of Lord Protector, there's a sword of state, uh, there's a swearing in ceremony, there's all that kind of quasi-monarchical uh, regalia that's associated with it. He also has um, Hampton Court Palace as, as his base outside London, um, and that's decorated with the kind of things that one, associates with um, the monarch, paintings, tapestries uh, that are leftovers from Charles I's uh, great aesthetic uh, experiment in taste. Um, Cromwell's a great lover of music. He has the organ from Magdalen College, Oxford, taken into Hampton Court. Um, and so there is this quasi-monarchical awe around him uh, which is resented by many of those who are true Republicans, who feel that Cromwell has, by becoming Lord Protector, by accepting these monarchical robes, that he has somehow betrayed what's known as the good old cause. And so those opponents will be people like Henry Vane and John Milton, uh, who keeps a close eye on Cromwell to see if he betrays what those saints, what the new modelled army uh, 
what the Republicans and the people who become known as Commonwealth's men actually uh, supported in the beginning and hoped they were attaining. It's interesting you bring up uh, John Milton because that just reminds me of reading Paradise Lost in, in school, which I'm guessing was a inspiration for the title of Providence Lost. Yes, it was. No, absolutely. I mean, it's it's it's, it's completely um, it's completely a play on uh, on Paradise Lost. I mean, Milton. It's, it's, I, I don't deal with Milton to any great extent in this because, of course, Paradise Lost comes after, and it's a work of um, the Restoration. And, and in many ways, Milton is a kind of sweet, generous figure because, although Milton is seen as a great Christian writer. Uh, many of his ideas, and I think those around him, came from really classical republicanism and the republicanism that was very strongly identified with the Republic of Venice at this time. And Venice Venice had been cultivated to a certain extent in the early 17th century uh, by English politicians and diplomats because it was seen as a kind of perfect model of, of a republic, the inheritor of the classic ideals of, of Rome in many ways. Um, and of course it was an island state, a maritime state. Um, and indeed in 1656, John Harrington, who was a, a particularly brilliant um, political thinker at that time, um, wrote a work called Oceana, which was presented to Cromwell and was very specifically aimed as a kind of instruction book for Cromwell on how to build a perfect republic. Um, and it was modelled very much on the Venetian Republic. And, and in fact, this had been going on for a long while because even Charles I um, in the 1630s had talked about the idea that his opponents wanted to make him a Duke of Venice, as he called it, a, a Doge of Venice, an elected monarch in in that kind of way so these ideas were around and milton was there but I, I don't think they were things that appealed particularly to cromwell cromwell was not this kind of intellectual cromwell was a conservative in many ways and many of those around him were conservatives they they often refer to the ancient constitution and they are not by nature and by disposition anti-monarchical they tried a great deal to maintain the monarchy but just became exasperated by Charles I's behaviour and could find no way, no way out. And I think that's why they found it so difficult to deal with, because they didn't have a plan to replace it in the way that perhaps the radical Republicans like Vane or Milton would have had. And speaking of the methods of government after the execution of Charles, um, one of the more famous or probably infamous experiments of the protectorate was the rule of the major generals and the division of England into military districts and military governance. Um, but I'm curious if you could explain a bit more about what the aims of the major generals were aside from just governance and uh, whether, whether these made them popular. Um, well, yes, the this is this is really where it all went wrong and this is this is what i mean by providence lost um the germ of the major generals is found in a royalist uprising that took place in march 1655 it was very much a damp squib and the only place where it caused even the remotest bit of trouble was in the southwest at something called the Penruddock Rising, a rising that's named after a man called John Penruddock, who was a sort of gentry figure and royalist there, who pretty much knew that it was um, that it was all a bit of a waste of time, but went through it anyway and paid for it with his life. Um, and to a certain extent, it revealed just how secure uh, the protectorate regime was. There was absolutely no chance short of a foreign invasion um, of the Cromwellian regime being remotely in danger, certainly not from within. A foreign invasion was not going to happen. And the idea of a royalist uprising of any menace went out the window and it was proven 
um, in March 1655. But the way in which they resisted it in the southwest was um, through John Desborough, uh, who was related uh, to Cromwell. Many, many of these people uh, were closely related through marriage. Um, and Desborough formed a kind of militia group, used local militia groups there. And the use of militia groups rather than the army, because it's cheaper than using the army, became a model for what was known, what became known as the rule of the major generals. But this was not conceived at this point. This just became a possible template for the future. Because the way the major generals came about was really following the disaster of the Western design. Now, the Western design was Cromwell's seaborne attack on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean, what is now uh, the island shared between Haiti and the Dominican Republic. It's a large island, it's substantial, and it was seen as opening, a potential opening uh, for Britain in the Caribbean and the riches of Spain's new world. Uh, Spain was very much the enemy, black Spain, very much the enemy in the Cromwellian worldview. And the Cromwellian worldview, I think, I would argue, was essentially an Elizabethan one. Cromwell was well read in terms of the Bible, in terms of scripture. But it may well be that the only secular book he ever read, if one can call it a secular book, is Walter Raleigh's History of the World. And of course, Walter Raleigh was one of the great heroes, along with people like Francis Drake, Hawkins, uh, who were these piratical colonial figures who went out into the new world and took on the Spanish there. Uh, with these little private adventures that they had, bringing wealth back to Elizabeth I. And Elizabeth I was a great hero of Cromwell. Great. I mean, he adored her and often refers to her as the Blessed Elizabeth. Um, and that worldview informed the idea that now, with Britain under the heel of Cromwell and his regime, with no threat from other European countries, that now was the time to send a state-backed enterprise with this terrific battle-tested, battle-hardened army, this huge navy that he had, send them out into the new world, take Hispaniola and use it as a launching pad for possessions in the Spanish new world. Remember, God is on their side. God has supported them all this time, supported them through thick and thin. They've never lost any serious military encounter. What greater proof could there be that God's guiding hand is asking them to take on Catholic Spain in the New World, the Habsburgs in the New World? So a project is put together. John Lambeth's a bit sniffy about this. He's not sure about it. There are others who oppose it, but Cromwell is convinced by this, uh, convinced by some rather um, loose characters, shall we say. But anyway, it comes into uh, play. The responsibility for organising it is handed over to John Desborough, who we mentioned previously. And the command for the Western design is shared uh, between the Admiral, William Penn, uh, who is the father of the William Penn, who founded Pennsylvania, um, and a person called Robert Venables, who's in charge of the army forces there, who's a man who's campaigned through Ireland uh, with Cromwell, uh, thinks he hasn't got quite the recognition he deserves, and now finally has it. And they set off uh, via Barbados to Hispaniola, and it is a catastrophe. That's the only word one could possibly use for it. Desborough has proved an absolutely useless organiser of this. Uh, there isn't enough water. There isn't 
appropriate food, there isn't appropriate clothing, no account is taken uh, for the weather and conditions in the tropics. They imagine they're still fighting in Ireland or somewhere so far as um, equipment goes. It is a catastrophe. Uh, they do take Jamaica as an afterthought, which is the last personal possession of the Columbus family and is not very well fortified, but it's seen as very much a kind of wooden spoon possession. And Venables and Penn head back uh, in shame to London and are put in the tower and Cromwell is absolutely, his world is rocked by this. It is, it is a disaster. Um, and of course, he asks the question of God, why hast thou forsaken me? What, what have we done wrong? And he concludes, along with his circle, that though England is on its way to the promised land, it's not there yet. And he uses a wonderful Cromwellian phrase. He describes England as under circumcision, but rule. And we can see what that means, that they are on their way to their new Jerusalem, but there's still a way to go. And the conclusion is that if there is to be healing and settling in the nation, there has to be a greater emphasis on moral and religious reformation. The country has to be cleansed in a way, the country has to be purified. And so the way to go about this is to divide England and Wales into 11 different regions, each of which comes under the control of one of Cromwell's major generals, very, very close allies, often family members. Um, and this is not liked by the general population. For one, it treads on the toes of the local leading families who've been the people who have generally tended to be the, the ones people look up to, the ones who tend to have some kind of local power there. It also knocks the noses out of joint of the JPs and the people who are the natural administrators of justice here. They don't like to see these upstarts, some of whom are just regarded as thimble makers, uh, some of them who just turned up and suddenly become this new ruling class. They don't like this. But then there's also the resistance to the kind of closing down of inns and race meetings, uh, which is often associated with uh, the Cavaliers and Royalists, brothels, gambling, all this is closed down. Some of the major generals are relatively pragmatic and do their deals with the local uh, leading families and JPs and their militias that they raise within these regions are not particularly uh, aggressive or anything. Others, like Charles Worsley, for example, uh, who is the person who's in charge of Lancashire, Cheshire, Staffordshire, that part of the world, is a fanatic of the most fundamental kind, and he literally works himself to death, closing down brothels and gambling dens and pubs and all this, that and the other. Um, and they are deeply unpopular. But because they live in a bubble, as people who live in bubbles often do, and they tell themselves how wonderful they are and they're only listening to their allies, they become convinced that they're doing a really good job and that people really, really like the job they're doing. And so they call for elections to give them a further mandate for this moral crackdown. Cromwell warns them about this. He's not at all sure uh, that they will benefit from this, but he gives in and elections are called. And all but one of the major generals is returned as an MP. It's true, but many, many more of their opponents take place take their places in Parliament. And so they realise that they're not quite as popular as they were. And they try to extend the idea of um, their rule with something called a militia bill, which actually met 
this is the last time Parliament met on Christmas Day in 1656, which everyone's been talking about quite recently, uh, because there might be a sitting of Parliament on Christmas Day uh, this year uh, for the first time. Uh, well, it didn't end well. What happened was that many of the Puritan uh, MPs and the major generals sat in Parliament on Christmas Day to pass something called a militia bill, which would extend um, the rule of the major generals. Uh, they were all rather angry that no one was really taking much notice of the ban on Christmas. All the shops were closed. They, many of them had been um, uh, woken from sleep the night before during the festivities. And there was a great deal of opposition to this. And to be frank, with Cromwell's connivance as well, the rule of the major generals soon came to an end. It was realised it was all a bit of a disaster and actually rather quickly forgotten. And the rule of the regions went back to something similar to its traditional form. I think you touch on it in Providence Lost, but you do suggest that Cromwell perhaps pushed Lambert to launch and attempt the militia bill in, in a sense to give him enough rope to hang himself or to hang the major generals. Yes, um, that's that's a possibility. I mean, the, the problem is with Cromwell, he's often not there when these events take place. Uh, the great historian of this period, Blair Worden, uh, uses a phrase about Cromwell when he said he was practised at not knowing. He's <laughs> never quite there in the public eye when these things take place. And so no one's ever quite sure what Cromwell's intentions are or actions or beliefs are about all kinds of things. And this is the classic example. But he was pretty reluctant to seek the mandate in the first place. And I think he was one of those people who was a fairly pragmatic um, politician in some ways like this. And I think he saw the way the wind was blowing. Did we really need? And I, and he, I think he was genuinely concerned about what he constantly referred to as the healing and settling of the nation. I think he just realised it wasn't working. And there were other things to think about as well. So, as you mentioned, a violent military uprising or foreign invasion was basically off the cards, but that wasn't the only way that opponents of the regime could strike at Cromwell's regime, um, the other being assassination. Were there any assassination attempts? There were lots. Um, most of them look rather like uh, Keystone Cops attempts. Um, the only one of any real significance came at a particularly turbulent time, actually in the wake of uh, the failure of the Militia Bill. And the Militia Bill itself was preceded by um, a rather troubling affair that revealed the divisions within the regime uh, between putting it very crudely, the Presbyterians on one side who wanted a kind of national church and were quite conservative in terms of religion, and then the independence of which Cromwell was one, or at least identified with, he, he was a congregationalist, um, who believed in a kind of greater uh, commitment towards religious liberty. So they, they were therefore um, accepting of people like Baptists and even sympathetic to Quakers. And it was a Quaker who opened up the fissures in the regime um, when a person called James Naylor, who was a very eloquent, very charismatic uh, Quaker, entered Bristol in October 1656, an imitation of Christ. And it was a very blasphemous act, uh, walking into Bristol, uh, actually sitting on a, on a donkey, uh, probably a donkey or a horse, depending on, on who you listen to, um, entering it in an act of what was perceived quite widely as blasphemy. Now, the problem is with the blasphemy laws at those times, they'd become rather liberal, so that even if you committed blasphemy three times, the worst that was going to happen to you was a six month prison sentence, according to legislature, because um, which shows how 
<clears throat> tolerant the regime was, at least of Protestant beliefs. Um, certainly not Catholics, and I'm not suggesting that, but in terms of the panoply of Protestant beliefs, of which there were many, uh, it was um, it was pretty liberal for its time. Um, but no one knew what to do with Naylor. And there was a sense, particularly on the Presbyterian side, that something has to be done. You can't go in imitation of Christ through Bristol and not pay some kind of punishment. So eventually, uh, to cut a long story short, Naylor comes before Parliament and he's put on trial. And there are real debates between those who are relatively sympathetic to him, like Lambert, and he was actually a quartermaster in Lambert's uh, army in the north during the Civil War, uh, Naylor, and uh, those who really just want to execute him. And in the end, uh, what happens to him is he's not executed, but he pays quite a price. His tongue is bored through, he's put in the stocks, He's got a great big B on his uh, on his forehead um, uh, that stands for blasphemy, obviously. Um, and these real divisions are there in Ukraine. Um, at the same time, there's an assassination attempt that's been put together by a very roguish figure with a real whiff of sulphur about him called Edward Sexby who's a former leveller, in other words, he's a religious radical, but who's allied himself with royalists in this kind of devil's alliance um, between opposing sides, just thinking, well, let's give it a go, and then we'll see where the cards fall. So he gets a person called Miles Syndicum uh, to put together an assassination attempt, which is essentially a gunpowder plot. It's a second gunpowder plot they put uh, tar and pitch, gunpowder, all kinds of explosive um, flammable devices uh, under Cromwell's um, residence. And uh, it's discovered, it's actually leaked. And um, Syndicum's arrested, the whole thing's broken up. Syndicum actually uh, takes poison in uh, prison um, and dies. Uh, but John Thurlow, who is Cromwell's spy master and a rather good spy master, intelligent chief, uh, informs Parliament of this disaster. And I think it concentrates minds about something that the protectorate regime never confronts. Who succeeds Cromwell? And there's a new civilian faction come through there. Um, which is um, focused around an Irish aristocrat, Roger Boyle, Lord Broyle, who um, is a, they become known as the Kinglings. They believe that the only way the regime can be made secure is if Cromwell takes the crown. And they adapt the instrument of government and make it, in a, it turn it into a more restricted uh, form um, so that it's less religiously tolerant. Um, it's just a bit more constricted and restricted. And part of the deal is that Cromwell will be offered the crown and it's worked out, is the crown hereditary? In other words, does it just pass to his eldest son, Richard? Uh, does it, is it then elected? Is the crown elected? Does he stay protector, which becomes a hereditary position, or is the protector elected? And the first thing they do is offer the crown to Cromwell, and Cromwell goes into some kind of retreat. It takes him about six weeks to decide whether to become Oliver the First. And you can just imagine that he is in constant dialogue with God. That's who he's asking, should I take this crown? And he eventually concludes in famous words that we shall not build Jericho again. In other words, God has taken the crown away for a reason and it's not for man to bring it back. And this leads to a very, very 
unsettled end to the protectorate. Because just like Elizabeth I, there's no real settlement. Does Cromwell not want to face his mortality? He's getting, he's in his late 50s now. He's had a very challenging, physically challenging career as a cavalry officer. Uh, he suffers from malaria, picked up in the fens. He's probably got gout, all kinds of ailments, as well as the stress. I mean, can you imagine the stress of being the ruler in this new experiment in government? Um, and it's not settled. And when, when Cromwell does die on that fateful date again, 3rd of September in 1658, Thurlow, his spy master, claims that Cromwell wants Richard to accept the title of Lord Protector, which he does. But no one's quite sure whether that's Thurlow interpreting Cromwell's thoughts, is it? Is it Thurlow just making it up? No one knows. No one knows. But the title of Lord Protector passes to Richard, who has no real experience in government at all. Uh, Cromwell's other son, Henry, has a, has a great deal of um, experience, not least in Ireland, where he's been quite a pragmatic figure after the terribly divisive and aggressive figure of Charles Fleetwood. Um, so in many ways, he'd have been a better choice, which Richard gets it. Richard has no political experience at all. He also does not have the trust of the army. And this is absolutely crucial because, as I've said repeatedly, the protectorate rests fundamentally on the strength of the army. And the army doesn't really like Richard. And people like Lambert, who's been rather marginalised since uh, the uh, since the kinglings have become uh, the ascendant, um, he returns, and the radicals return. The radical Republicans are on the streets of London. The pamphlets start emerging again, and there is this kind of feeling that the country is going back to the divisions and possible warfare of the 1640s. And so, again, cutting a long story short, a figure called George Monk, who is the head of the Parliamentary Army in Scotland, which is better paid than the forces in England, simply because the Scots are taxed more. Um, so they're better paid. March down from Coldstream uh, in Scotland on the borders and march into London. And from then on, although there's no absolute certainty at that point, it now looks inevitably, because nothing's inevitable in history, that the restoration is on the cards and the restoration does happen. And when Charles II sails along the Thames to his restoration, he is accompanied, no less, by William Penn, the Admiral of the Western Design. So you have this period now where some people are in fear of their lives, particularly the regicides who signed the death warrant of Charles I, Charles II's father. And there are those who are less compromised who are seeking a future. And there are those eternal turncoats like, uh, and perpetual turncoats like George Monk, who now find themselves in very prestigious positions, and people who've been loyal throughout to Charles II, like Clarendon, who writes the first great history of the Civil Wars, and people like Daniel O'Neill, who's been this great, brave, royalist agent flitting back and forth from Britain to the continent, conspiring throughout. These people are quids in all of a sudden. And you have this strange new regime of people who were once on Parliament side, some on royalist side, 
who come together to create a coalition because there's really no alternative to the king and you have this return to the ancient constitution. I think there's a line that I you wrote in Providence Lost that I love so much that I specifically uh, quoted it in full and I look forward to using it in the podcast. Um, but you describe Richard Cromwell as the worst prepared adult head of state in British history, which he's up against some some strong competition there. And I don't think you're necessarily wrong. Well, there's probably more around now than there has been. <laughs> there are probably more contenders for that position now than when I wrote the book. Um, <laughs> but um, yes, I mean, he was he was a man, a perfectly good man. And, and until our present queen, he was the longest lived head of state in British history. He lived well into the 18th century in, in Hampshire, just a you know, farmer, landowner, uh, a man who came to terms with the regime and wasn't uh, wasn't bothered by them at all. Um, and long outlived um, Charles II. But um, he was woefully ill-prepared and he just wasn't the person for the time. I mean, I think the only person who probably could have carried it through, uh, with the exception of Henry Cromwell, who was a gifted and able son and, and politician and soldier, uh, was John Lambert. But then Lambert was much more of a genuine Republican than Cromwell was. And it would have had to have been a very different form of government. Uh, but you could imagine Lambert as a successor as Lord Protector to Cromwell. Um, but there wasn't really anyone else there who had the trust of the army, had the political skills, had the pragmatic skills, because one can only be so pure in governance of, as we're discovering. And, um, uh, you know, one, one faces the realities of the world. And Cromwell was fairly good at that. His great mistake, and he's by no means the first to make this mistake in English or British history, is that he simply didn't sort out the succession. Uh, he had sons, so there wasn't a problem in terms of fecundity or anything like that. They were there, but they were not prepared. And I, th I don't know whether it was like Elizabeth, an unwillingness to face his mortality. I don't know whether it was a kind of disposition he had to dithering and uncertainty. I think the most convincing argument is that he thought God didn't want it. And if God didn't want him to be king, then there was nothing he could do about it. And he wasn't willing to go against God's judgment. And I think that was why he did it. I, I do think that in that sense, Cromwell was a man who always tried to do what he thought God wanted. And in many ways in doing so, he sowed the seeds for the ultimate failure of his regime. And I think in the answer to this question, his behaviour of the succession will play into it. But how do you rate Oliver Cromwell as a ruler? <laughs> it's, um, well, uh, he inherited a very, very difficult situation. Um, in it, in many ways, I think he comes out of it rather well. I think he was a man of genuine religious tolerance in terms of 17th century standards. I mean, he was no modern liberal in the way that we think of it, but I think he was a person who was genuinely committed to religious tolerance, which considering uh, what was going on in the continent uh, during and after the Thirty Years' War was something quite noble and quite extraordinary and quite progressive in a way, if we want to talk in those terms. I think he was a person who offered a country security after the catastrophe of the civil wars. Um, and I think he was plainly a person who could keep strange alliances together, not natural alliances. And the fact that he remained 
the most powerful figure in British political life for one of its most turbulent decades suggest he was a man of considerable charisma. He was a man of real power. And I do think he is one of the most significant figures in British history. I mean, I one never quite has the power that one wants in the sense that there are always unintended consequences. Um, and of course, the, the unintended consequence is that almost everything that Cromwell desired, which was that kind of re religious tolerance, which was a king accountable to parliament, uh, a major presence for Britain in the world, came about. Uh, legal reforms, which were quite an important but unacknowledged uh, part of the regime, were significant. Um, the non-conformist tradition in Britain that informs liberalism and, of course, informs the Labour Party um, never disappeared again, in fact, grew stronger. So I think whether Cromwell would have agreed with those things, he opened the door to all those aspects. And Britain would have been a very, very different place had it not been for Cromwell and those around him. Um, Britain may well have been far more of a European absolutist regime, which is what Charles certainly aspired to. He was very taken with the idea of European absolutism that reaches its apotheosis in Louis XIV. And so the revolution, if we want to call it, that took place in the 17th century here, was in many ways less traumatic than the one that took place in France during the 18th century, for example, and in other countries. It set Britain, intended or unintended, on a more stable path than one could argue than perhaps other European countries. Well, this has been a delight and a pleasure. Thank you so much, Paul, for coming on. Um, if listeners want to read more of your work, are you currently working on anything? I am uh, w just started working on something. I mean, you never just start working because it's always, <laughs> always there in the background. But um, I just want to explore uh, what I was talking about earlier, about the way in which people competed for positions and places just before and just after the restoration. So I'm looking towards that as a kind of sequel um, at the moment, but um, one that's much more focused on a smaller period of time. Uh, and But I think that kind of jockeying for position that one finds there is fascinating and, and is quite revealing about human nature. Fantastic. I'm really looking forward to that because that was one of my favorite parts of Providence Lost was the was, like you said, the jockeying for status and 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 the maneuvering of factions between civilian and military and Puritan, independent, Quaker, leveler. All of that was so fascinating. So I'm very excited to see what you uh, what you bring out next. So uh, once again, thank you very much for coming on. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks once again to Paul for speaking with me. If you'd like to read Providence Lost, The Rise and Fall of Cromwell's Protectorate, you can find it in all good bookshops. Also, if you'd like to hear more from Paul and are listening to this interview shortly after its release, then head on over to the Cromwell Museum website, cromwellmuseum.org. On the 13th of January 2021, Paul Lay will be giving a talk about Cromwell's Western design, which we touched on only briefly in this interview. His talk is actually the first in a series hosted by the Cromwell Museum, and if you're an avid listener of Pax Britannica, then all of their talks will interest you. I'll leave a link to Paul's talk in the description of this episode. Thank you once again to Paul for coming on Pax Britannica, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening.